Hello, everyone. My name is Ruben Major. I am a paramedic uh, program director and chief executive officer for EMS University. And today I am going to be going over naloxone administration, otherwise uh, known as the brand uh, Narcan administration. And uh, while this lecture is presented by EMS University, it has been adapted from uh, the Los Angeles County uh, EMS uh, Authority. A special thanks for this program development. Uh, go to the UCLA Center for Pre-Hospital Care and the Los Angeles EMS Agency Curriculum Committee, uh, which is really good because they were able to provide us with a lot of the uh, materials that we are going to be using in this lecture today. In fact, 95% uh, of it. The objectives of this particular program are to review the assessment of uh, patients who are complaining of altered level of consciousness or suspected opiate overdose. Uh, also, we're going to be talking about the pathophysiology as well as the causes, uh, initial treatment of altered level of consciousness, and uh, suspected opioid overdoses. We're also going to be discussing the scope of practice changes uh, for these in Narcan. And this is in, uh, particularly important, especially with regard to this particular movement uh, to allow EMTs to administer this particular drug. Uh, we're also going to be talking about the typical things that you would uh, discuss with regard to administration of uh, drugs, medication. And also, um, we're going to be talking about uh, recommended factors that should be existing in order for ENTs to administer particular drugs. The important disclaimer here is that uh, the administration of Narcan is not necessarily approved by all EMS agencies nationwide. In fact, there's a movement in California at this current time, 2019, to approve this particular drug for use uh, by EMTs uh, in, uh, of course, consultation with local protocol and the medical director. Um, but again, it is very important um, and necessary to make sure that you're always following local protocols with regard to the assessment of treatment that's recommended. And uh, also don't uh, administer Narcan unless you're approved by your local protocol and agency medical director. Uh, as far as objectives are concerned, we're going to talk about what you need to do before the medication itself is administered. We're going to also demonstrate the ability to successfully administer Narcan uh, for both IM and nasal administration. And uh, please do forgive me, I do sometimes uh, tend to call it uh, Narcan, uh, when in fact that is the brand name. Uh, naloxone is the uh, generic name for this particular drug. Uh, but again, uh, do forgive me for that. Uh, you're also going to want to know the appropriate documentation that's needed for this uh, medication administration. If we couldn't beat it into your heads enough, uh, make sure you're following local protocol. So this is considered to be a new scope of practice for EMTs in uh, some areas. Uh, EMA agency might uh, stock Narcan if they have applied and been approved by their medical director. Uh, and again, following local protocol. EMTs that are approved, um, they can use a stock Narcan or Naloxone when they are on duty and working for this provider agency that's been provided by the uh, agency medical director. Um, as always, uh, an EMT may assist uh, patients with their own medication provided that uh, they're approved to do so by uh, local protocol. So what's the problem here? Well, there's a lot of deaths from opioid uh, overdoses. Uh, we're seeing uh, hair on use increase uh, fentanyl is in increasing at a uh, pretty fast rate. And heroin that uh, unfortunately is combined with fentanyl is uh, skyrocketing. So, um, you know, as you can see in these uh, facts, statistics here, um, you know, we've, it's just an exponential amount of heroin that's been tested containing uh, fentanyl. And uh, of course, this increases the uh, high for the person, and uh, that's the reason why they uh, tend to want to do uh, these uh, two together. Uh, the opioid-related deaths also uh, from uh, synthetic opioids are on the rise. You can just see these uh, numbers, uh, you know, skyrocketing. So, of course, uh, we're going to try to do something about it uh, by allowing uh, EMTs in some locations to administer uh, naloxone. So here's some common opioids for you, and uh, I think this is probably really helpful uh, so that you can get an idea of you know, all the different medications which do contain opioids that, um, you know, uh, are, are being discussed here today. So 
Uh, codeine is one that's a very popular um, medication, uh, prescription medication, fentanyl, uh, as we discussed, morphine. Also, you will know your ALS providers that can uh, give morphine. That's also given to the hospital as well. Uh, hydrocodone, uh, typically prescribed uh, pain management, uh, hydromorphine, uh, which again, uh, Dilaudid, if you're not familiar with that, uh, this is a drug that's given a lot in the emergency departments. And uh, Demerol, as well as uh, Methadone, uh, methadone uh, has also um, usually been, been given to help people who have this uh, opioid addiction and, and uh, so that they don't come down as hard. Uh, we've also got uh, nalbutamine, um, uh, excuse me, ubane, uh, oxycodone, uh, which is Percocet, very uh, popular medication. And uh, you can see all these others here. Uh, heroin, uh, if you haven't seen, uh, this is a, these are some pretty good uh, kind of pictures and figures on uh, what that looks like and uh, how people will put that into their body. So when you talk about pathophysiology of opioid overdoses, uh, what you can see from this particular uh, figure is that the opioids are going to sit right there on these uh, receptors. And so uh, this is uh, pretty interesting because it demonstrates how uh, this opioid gets into the uh, cells so that it um, acts on the body and the brain. The administration of uh, Narcan is going to be discussed next. Uh, so uh, basically, this little figure says, uh, I have Narcan. Please ask for my help. I'm trained to help in an overdose, <laughs> which is funny. Um, so, you know, what was important in any kind of um, medication administration is making sure that you're uh, preparing properly to give this medication. And, you know, that always starts with scene safety and uh, body substance isolation precautions. Uh, it's particularly important to think about, you know, some of the things that could be around, uh, such as, you know, hazards if somebody's using drugs, you know, on a regular basis, uh, you might encounter some needles. Um, and, you know, this is really important to make sure that you're not just uh, taking your hands and moving them around places that you can't see, uh, and also keeping yourself um, grounded and uh, situationally aware uh, because sometimes um, people can have a tendency to get violent uh, when uh, under the use of uh, drugs. So also make sure that you are taking your body substance isolation precautions, your gloves, your masks, uh, as well as eye protection, whatever's needed. And make sure that you use caution when you're performing a body check. And remember, um, you know, not just feeling around, you know, the area, but also the patient. I mean, this uh, needles can be in a patient's pocket. Uh, they can be, you know, just in the craziest places. So you just want to make sure that you're not putting yourself in a situation where you could be uh, in danger. And uh, that goes for any patient, for that matter. So your primary assessment, the way that it looks like usually is, um, you know, we're going to see some type of altered level of consciousness because these uh, particular opioids are going to act on the CNS and uh, they're going to depress people. Uh, so basically, depressed uh, means that, uh, you know, they're going to be uh, down, slower to respond. A lot of times uh, you're going to see slower breathing. Uh, you can see pale skin, cool, clammy, that kind of stuff. Uh, are we look we're looking immediately for life-threatening emergencies or uh, conditions that we can address, as well as um, doing our apps too. So remember, alert to verbal, painful stimulus, and unresponsive. And uh, as always, if you see the patient uh, not breathing properly and uh, it's inadequate, you start with a positive pressure ventilation, give that oxygen, get it going, uh, attain your uh, saturation uh, to begin with, that always helps. And then uh, assess and manage circulation. Make sure you're checking pulses and uh, you know carotid as well as uh, distal pulses to see uh, what your blood pressure could be right away for your uh, primary. Um, not necessarily going uh, to the vital signs quite uh, yet, but uh, again, on primary assessment, making sure that uh, you know you check, you're checking for these life-threatening conditions. So secondary assessment, uh, we're looking at uh, samples. So remember um, the sample acronym, uh, uh, focusing your assessment on associated body regions. Uh, what time did this happen? What are the vital signs like? So again, blood pressure, pulse, respiration, so on and so forth. What does their skin look like? Uh, so like I said, uh, typically, uh, you know, if it's really bad, uh, you're going to see some pale, cold, clammy skin. And, uh, you know, these are pretty interesting because uh, when you do eventually give the Narcan, it really can have a dramatic effect. And we'll go over that in just a little bit. Uh, is there some accessory muscle usage? So really focusing on respiration, oxygenation, and, uh, again, 
of obtaining that uh, CO2. And, you know, it's very important to note that, uh, you know, these patients can really uh, deteriorate very rapidly. So you want to be extra special careful and attentive to detail, getting that oxygen going and taking care of those uh, respirations as soon as possible. Uh, you want to assist them with their, if you want to assist them with their own um, Narcan, uh, an ALS unit has to be requested and uh, this should be prescribed to the patient, uh, should meet the indications and there shouldn't be any contraindications. So uh, we kind of talked a little bit about signs and symptoms of opioid overdose. I give you the more dramatic ones, uh, but uh, you know, just to reiterate here, um, if you're still, you're looking at altered mental status. Um, are they really drowsy? Do they have shallow breathing? Um, what do the pupils look like? So, you know, when they're, when they're down and things are slow, we're going to see the pupils uh, going to become pinpoint. And if they're bradycardic, um, you know, that's usually uh, one of the symptoms of um, opioid overdose. I uh, have not encountered tachycardia personally uh, in an opioid overdose, although um, it is possible. I think you're kind of more looking for the uh, depressed symptoms rather than anything else. But again, um, you know, this, is, this is something that is uh, indeed possible. Uh, what does the environment look like? You know, so we're going to be looking around for any drugs or paraphernalia, and are there uh, syringes in the area? Also, remember that uh, you uh, should be looking for the thing active acronym called AEIOU TIPS, and uh, you can read this on your own. Uh, the criteria for administering the lockdown by an EMT again. Um, you know, the ALS unit should be en route if you're administering naloxone. The EMTs can transfer the patient if the ETA for the ALS unit exceeds the ETA for um, the ER. So basically, um, you know, we want to get them to advanced care as soon as possible. And it is not necessary to wait around, um, again, if your uh, ALS unit is going to be longer than it takes the hospital. So, for example, if it takes you five minutes to the hospital, your nearest ALS unit is all the way across town, 30 minutes away. Obviously, it's smarter to go to the emergency department use common sense. Uh, the mechanism of action here for naloxone, uh, well, it, again, um, this is kind of very similar to the, the last slide that we looked at uh, for the pathophysiology, but it reverses the effects of opioids by uh, competing with receptor sites. So we take a look here, you see the Narcan um, gets in there and kind of just stops uh, the uh, opioid, which is these uh, purple uh, little balloons, I guess, from getting into the uh, cells and nothing happens. And of course, uh, the patient, you, you can see they'll get a little bit upset later. We'll talk about that uh, because they're not, you're taking them away from their high. Um, you're reversing the respiratory and CNS suppressant side effects as well of this particular medication. Uh, recommended dosage, uh, you can see here, you're looking at uh, two mil milligrams uh, IM or IN for the adult. Um, and uh, this is how it's carried. And then pediatric is uh, 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, based on the formulation of one milligram per ml. So your max dose is two milligrams. Uh, onset, usually this particular drug works pretty quick and uh, I've, I've had uh, some pretty uh, interesting experiences with this particular medication uh, myself. Um, it literally uh, appears to bring people back from the dead. So um, again, you walk in, you see this person on the ground and they're pale, cool, clammy, hardly breathing. And then you give them Narcan and then by God, they wake up and, you know, they're uh, sometimes wanting to fight with you. Uh, so uh, the duration of this particular drug lasts for about uh, 20 to 120 minutes, uh, plenty of time usually to uh, take over all the uh, effects of the opioid. As far as the indications are concerned, again, if you suspect that they could be an uh, opioid overdose and their uh, altered mental status, um, you're also going to want to check for uh, hypoventilation and apnea. So uh, slow, shallow breathing. If uh, these things all combined together are present, um, and this is when this particular drug is indicated for use. Uh, contraindication. So if you know you arrive and the patient has um, got ad adequate breathing, um, you are not going to be giving this medication, even if they have altered mental status. Um, and the thing is, is that you know we're really most concerned about uh, breathing issues here. So again, if they're not breathing right and you think they could have been on an opioid, uh, you know, it is best to play it safe and give the medication. Um, but, you know, if they're breathing just fine, don't give it to them. It's just like not giving CPR to somebody who's awake and talking to you. Uh, the other thing is if the patient's in cardiac arrest, it's really futile. 
to give this particular drug um, and uh, will require uh, ALS intervention first prior to going down that particular route. Side effects. Um, so there's a lot of them. Um, we could see increased heart rate, high blood pressure, chest pain, arrhythmia. So basically, um, the other thing that's important, like I said, is you're going to see uh, potentially a reversal of any of the effects of an opioid. And so that kind of um, will make them irritable as well. So you'll see some uh, potential anxiety or agitation. Uh, I know there's all those stories out there about, uh, you know, uh, these uh, the patients, uh, you know, becoming very agitated. And so um, in my personal experience, I haven't quite seen them get so agitated to where they are fighting. However, um, I have I have heard that on many occasions. And um, so, you know, it's best to be safe, keep yourself protected. Remember, the pain safety is uh, ongoing. So don't put yourself in a situation, um, you know, which uh, you, where you may be unsafe. Um, make sure that you're protected. And uh, that's, you know, very important. So seizures. Uh, can occur, nervousness, restlessness, uh, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and uh, pulmonary edema on the respiratory side. Again, it is very important to note that Narcan might induce uh, withdrawal. So just be prepared to deal with these patients, and there could be uh, some vomiting, which is no fun either. So uh, it couldn't hurt to make, make sure that you're masked up and you've got uh, uh, also your facial uh, shield on, eye protection. Preparing this uh, naloxone, so uh, we use the acronym DICE, and what that is is um, the we need to know uh, that it's the right drug name, uh, the integrity of the medication container, uh, making sure that you know it's all intact the way it should be. So you should be checking this on a regular basis so they know actually know exactly what it looks like, um, and uh, what's the concentration and dose. Is that correct? Uh, we used to also use the five uh, right the uh, in medication administration clarity. So, you know, is the uh, medication clear and what's the expiration date? So don't, uh, unless uh, you have some sort of overridden protocol through your uh, state EMS authority, local uh, EMS agency, as well as uh, medical director, um, obviously do not give any medications that are past the expiration date. Uh, also clarity is very important because, you know, if you've got chunks in there, you probably don't want to get this medication. So there's two kinds of uh, ways that you're going to administer naloxone. The first way is the intranasal, and we'll go over that. And the next way is intramuscular, which um, as a paramedic, uh, we did the intramuscular all the time. It's very simple. Uh, but again, the intranasal nasal is a lot safer. So definition before we go over this. Um, milligram. Uh, and this is very basic, but it is important to go through. So milligram is basically a unit of measurement uh, used to describe the strength of medication, the metric system equal to a thousandth of a gram. Um, also, uh, the strength in uh, 0.1 uh, mg, for example, is equal to 0 0.001 grams. Uh, milliliter, similar. So milliliter is equal to 0 0.001 liters. That's the amount. So we're trying to get these two mixed up. Milliliter is the fluid, and milligram is the actual medication itself. That, that usually helps me uh, when trying to figure this out. Uh, dosage calculations. Uh, so we, we call it HAV1. Uh, for example, if you have a pediatric patient who's 10 kilograms, I would say that they're purple on this chart. So uh, you can see that the purple criteria is 10 to 11 um, kilograms. Uh, and the dosage is one milligram. So that's what you want. The way that you calculate this out is 0.1 milligrams per kilogram times that, times that 10 kilograms and then that's equal to one milligram. Um, so you have one, um, and here in this one, uh, you have one ampule, for example, containing two milligrams and one ml of naloxone. How do you uh, draw, how much do you draw up in milliliters? And so uh, basically here, uh, you can see the calculation, how that works. Administration procedure. So naloxone can be withdrawn from an ampule or a vial. And the ampule is the thing that you break all into the middle there. So like usually it's uh, glass. Uh, so you got to be careful there too because that's a potential um, you know, way of cutting yourself. Although not usually uh, would you expose yourself that way. It is possible if you have blood on your hands already and then you cut uh, yourself at the same time. 
So just be extra careful with that glass when you're breaking it. Uh, grab it from both ends. <clears throat> and uh, the vial also on the far left. Both of them are going to use the needle. So here's how you do the medication withdrawal from the uh, single dose ampule. Uh, what you'll need first is the yeah, ampule itself, a 3 ml syringe, alcohol, uh, two by two gauge, filter needles, and uh, these other two things. So when you withdraw the medication, you're gonna first make sure that you uh, flick the kind of, there's usually a little bit of uh, fluids that like to hang out there at the top. You wanna flick them down to the bottom to help gravity use it. Um, and then you're gonna use a two by two gauze to snap that ampule away. So that's the proper procedure there. Um, and again, keep it away from fingers so that you don't cut yourself. When you withdraw the medication, uh, make sure you pull that cap off the filter needle and insert the needle in the ampule. And the filter needle is important um, because that way, if there's any glass or any residue or whatever that gets stuck in there, um, it'll actually uh, take that out. You uh, invert the ampule or you pull back the plunger, withdraw the medication. Just make sure you have the right medication again and then remove that filter needle and place it in a sharp container. The reason why you're removing it is because you don't want to re-inject the patient or inject the patient with any glass. So the procedure for medication withdrawal from the vial is going to be the next thing we're looking at. Uh, so uh, similar materials needed, uh, a little bit different. We have the, uh, of course, the, the naloxone vial, 3 ml syringe, alcohol wipe, uh, needle, and a mucosal atomization device. So when you withdraw the medication, you're going to remove the cap and then you're going to be cleaning it up to make sure that there's not any residue or anything that could be uh, inadvertently injected in the patient. And you're going to attach the one uh, to one and a half, 21 to 23 gin, uh, uh, gauge needle on a syringe, very specific. I'll pull back on the plunger to allow the air into the syringe and insert this needle into the clean top of the vial. Um, so basically what you're going to see is uh, that the air from the syringe is gonna go into the vial a little bit, but uh, if not, you can push this plunger uh, with air into the vial. Basically what you're trying to do is create um, a, I would say a vacuum for yourself so that when you uh, try to drop the medication, it's a little bit easier. So insert the vial and withdraw this uh, naloxone into the syringe. Make sure that needle is below the surface of the medication and just uh, make sure that you have the right medication again. So it never hurts to check twice. Uh, make sure you remove this needle and place it into an approved sharp container. So uh, this is kind of like the filter needle method here, uh, what it's describing. Uh, so again, uh, just trying to get rid of that residue. Uh, naloxone withdrawn with the syringe can be administered, uh, again, both intranasally or intramuscularly. Uh, now we're going to talk about uh, the pre-filled nasal spray procedure. And again, this is a lot safer than using the needles. So this is what you're probably going to see a lot for uh, BLS uh, personnel. Uh, remove this uh, from the box and peel back the top. Remove the device. Uh, we talked about dice already. And uh, don't prime the device. It's not necessary. Um, it's going to deliver most of the medication into the air and not the patient. So don't do that. Um, hold this spray with your thumb on the bottom of the plunger with your first and middle finger. So just, uh, it's almost like a, a gun, but your uh, thumb is the trigger. And um, you're, pull, you're pushing on it, placing the tip in either nostril until the fingers touch the patient's nose. So you can see here, uh, basically the medication is being delivered intranasally. And do this very quickly. Um, patient might feel a little anxious, um, you know, if they're altered, um, but this is, this is important uh, in order to make sure that they're breathing properly and again if your your patient is um, super alert here then and there's no difficulty breathing then you're not going to be administering this medication so just something to think about as well the preloaded syringe uh, with the adapter administration uh, so what we're looking at is a two milligram to two ml solution um, <clears throat> basically here's a, a step on how to give this nasal spray or a four-step method and you can read this on your own. Nasal administration from syringe procedure. So you're going to attach the MAD device to the tip of the syringe if we're drawing from the ampular vial. You can uh, kind of an adaptation here. Place your thumb at the end, preloaded uh, uh, preload with your first middle finger on the wings, and push. Well, obviously it's going to be in the nose first. 
uh, place the head in the neutral position and gently place the tip of the MAD device in there. Uh, make sure you're depressing the plunger with the thumb um, to deliver about half the syringe. And basically, you can give the remainder of the medication in the other nostrils. Uh, and again, if you're giving positive pressure ventilation, uh, then you can resume it at this time. Uh, so something you don't want to interrupt uh, ventilation for very long. Reevaluate the patient. A pediatrics, uh, again, your dosage is 0.1 milligrams per kilogram, and uh, you got to have at least 0.5 cc's of fluid uh, for the nasal. A maximum C, uh, single dose must not exceed 2 milligrams. It's very important. Intramuscular injection procedure. Uh, so, again, we kind of went over these uh, uh, inject, injection methods. Um, get an auto injector, syringe, uh, withdrawal from a bile or ampule pre, uh, filtered needle. <clears throat> the procedure itself, uh, what you're going to want to do is make sure that uh, you're staying away from these uh, track marks uh, that you got here on the picture, blood vessels, because uh, you don't want to give too much of the medication at once. And areas that uh, are scarred or bruised, uh, and basically starting to make sure you have better absorption of the medication and avoiding bruising uh, for the same reasons. Do not administer this through clothing like you um, have seen done for the EpiPen. It's not the same. The intramuscular procedure, auto-injector. So, again, stife. Remember that. Uh, naloxone, auto-injector, uh, remove or cut clothing so, so you can expose the thigh. Clean it with an alcohol wipe using an aseptic technique. Now remove that auto-injector from the outer case and with your safety cap. Going to place this uh, the tip of this auto injector at 90 degrees. You push it down, pressure to activate uh, the device. Hold it for at least three seconds so that uh, you give that medicine uh, time to work. Discard this device, uh, device into a sharps container and uh, make sure you're reevaluating the patient. <clears throat> Intramuscular, uh, using a syringe, uh, very similar to the uh, previous method, just remove and uh, cut clothing. Identify uh, the location so you can see uh, three or four fingers pressed below the acrobat. Uh, acromion process, and this is a very good um, anatomical uh, picture. Um, basically, you're going to want to make sure you're hitting shoulder uh, just just a little bit below, and everybody's different, but you're looking for the muscular uh, area in the shoulder, uh, midline, if they were just, you know, um, facing the side. Again, some people might have a lot of tissue, so you're going to want to make sure that um, you're hitting the most muscular areas within that area. Clean the injection site, again, using a septic technique. Remove the cap on the needle and stretch the skin. Again, like I said, some people can have a lot of extra skin or they can have fat um, in that area. Put that needle in at 90 degrees. So you're basically just poking it straight, right in there. Don't be shy. Uh, intramuscular injection, deltoid muscle. So, again, this is um, kind of a more close-up picture of what we're uh, doing. Um, you're going to want to pull back on the plunger a little bit just before you inject to make sure that there's not a bunch of blood coming up because um, you don't want to inject into a blood vessel. And if you have a bunch of blood coming into the needle, it's likely that you're in a blood vessel and you need to select a different site. If you get into a situation like that, uh, what you need to do is you need to withdraw and start all over again. Uh, inject the medication slowly by depressing the plunger until the syringe is empty. And then it says use the other arm to deliver the medication in the event that you get blood in there. Make sure you're disposing and you're taking care of safety. <clears throat> uh, always uh, remove the needle and uh, activate the safety device if there is one. Apply pressure into the injection site with the opposite hand using sterile two-by-two to cover the band-aid. Same steps as before, reassessing the patient. So now that we've gone over the particular procedure, you want to make sure that you're evaluating the response. Um, you probably see an improved level of consciousness if um, they did indeed have an opioid overdose. Remember, there's other things that can cause uh, altered mental status. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that could be happening potentially, but uh, you know, this this is uh, one of the reasons why if we have a, uh, we're suspecting that there could be an opioid overdose, we're taking these particular steps. So repeat your ongoing assessment at a minimum of every five minutes. You should just be constantly assessing the patient to make sure that you know you're looking at their primary 
and uh, relevant portion of their secondary assessment, uh, taking their vital signs, checking that SpO2, and again, the most important thing is looking at the breathing. Are they breathing adequately or not? And taking care of that. You can repeat the dose of naloxone if there's limited or no response to the initial dose, and after two to three minutes, if you have not seen uh, or if ALS hasn't arrived. Again, uh, remember that ETH is the most appropriate uh, emergency unit has to exceed the ETA of the ALS unit. Make sure you're documenting everything. So, uh, you know, when I do documentation, I'm including everything. And so uh, just go down that line, your assessment finding, all the stuff, uh, sample, history, OPQRST, um, AEIOU tips, all that stuff. Um, your drug name, dose, route, site, time, all these different things, mental status, vital signs, and again, Respiratory, respiratory, respiratory. So again, um, I think what's important is that uh, you know once you have this education that you are uh, going through and uh, really understanding the reasons um, why this is so important now. Again, you saw those facts and figures on skyrocketing opioid use, and uh, you know I think we can really have an impact as uh, pre-hospital providers here uh, by using these. Uh, new techniques. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen and see you again next time.